Good morning. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come to this um, very exciting meeting. Uh, it's a very important meeting and in my mind and one that I'm sorry that I was not able to be at much of, but I know people from my laboratory and other laboratories in the NCI have been here and have found this to be extremely informative and most importantly, uh, provocative and stimulating because I think you know, the ENCODE and the, the, um, the mission and more importantly, the generation of data by ENCODE has really been the start and not the finish of a whole series of very important questions. So I wanted to today in the next 25 minutes or so talk about ENCODE, particularly in the study of trying to get at the complexity of cancer susceptibility. I'm not going to give you 50 examples and 500s, you know, different uh, levels of looking at uh, methylation marks, right, left, up, down, you know, inside out and beyond. I'm going to try and put it more in the context of how we're using it and where it's been helpful, but at the same time try and stimulate some of you who may not be thinking about cancer susceptibility to start thinking about it and how and what way to utilize the kinds of um, opportunities I think that ENCODE has really put in front of us. So really, when we think about the etiology of cancer, it, it is really complex. Uh, you know, we think of Mendelian diseases as a particular mutation that drives a disruption of a critical gene or pathway and there are important consequences. And there are the other 24,999 genes and their environment and the long non-coding RNAs and all the things that we add to that picture. But I think particularly when we think about cancer, which is something that in involves an extended period of time for the development thereof, we have to think very hard about the role of environment and lifestyle. You know, as we all know, BMI, smoking, uh, you know, all sorts of chemicals and the like are very important carcinogens, and they're part of this equation. There is this other side of genetic susceptibility, and there's an argument of how much is it of each. And there's some of us who think that it's probably 100% of both, okay? In, in other words, thinking what's the genetic susceptibility? What's the setting of your carburetor as you start out in life and you expose yourself either willingly or unwillingly to lots of environmental challenges and then the lifestyle changes that you make, you know, determining your weight, exercise, and by the way, you know, for, in our institute the view is physical activity is the next smoking and those who have lack of physical activity or do the wrong things are putting themselves at higher risk for diabetes, lung cancer, um, breast cancer, prostate cancer and the like. But really, we think of the environmental as the triggers and the genetics as a set point. And I'll spend pretty much the rest of the time talking about our understanding of what the set point is because we have very little understanding of really how the triggers actually interact with the genetic makeup that we have. We have a few examples, but very few. And I think this is where, in my mind, ENCODE needs to get environmental, so to speak, and thinking about not a model system, but how and in what way you take that information and you plug it into trying to understand how critical changes take place that would lead to very important diseases. And I happen to be interested in cancer, but the same thing can apply to diabetes, to coronary artery disease, neurodegenerative disorders, arthritis, and the like. So I think it's really critical. And then, of course, we also know that there are stochastic events. We know that there are errors in the program of DNA repair, which are very important. And then all the chance issues. And how important chance is? Well, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, some of us are a little bit skeptical of the statement of how, of how important chance is. I mean, I think that's more an attribution of what we don't understand as opposed to necessarily saying that it's truly chance at a probabilistic point of view, but we can debate that later. So really, when we think about this, we have to then now move into cancer. And in cancer, there are really four spaces that we live in. As you can see, above the line, the germ line, where I'll spend pretty much the most of my time talking, we know that there are a whole series of cancer syndromes that are important mutations in the germline that put someone at very high risk for developing cancer. There are moderate penetrance genes that are part of an oligogenic model, and then GWAS has been uh, very successful in cancer, and I'll talk a fair amount about that. Only a small fraction of what we have there is actually actionable maybe 26, 27 of the mutations do we really know what to do with. Uh, another 50, we have an idea, and then another 100, we think we could 
uh, surmise, but we really don't have the evidence. And then underneath there is the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth cancers genomes that are indeed the somatic alterations that live in the world of drivers and passengers, and we know that heterogeneity is very important. And we've really accumulated an extraordinary catalog with TCGA and the cosmic data. And then, you know, the excitement in cancer research is uh, all about targeted therapy. But again, targeted therapy is a very early concept, and it's not going to solve everything overnight. It is a very difficult thing to do. And then we have all the tests that are out there. So this is sort of the space that we live in between going from research to actually trying to figure out what's actionable. And frequency and or penetrance is not the only way to, to move from discovery to clinically actionable. It's to understand the functional consequences. And again, this is where ENCODE is a very useful tool to look at many of those things, particularly when we look at the moderately penetrant genes and some of the GWAS hits, and we'll come back to that. So, what happens when there's more than one genome? Well, we know that uh, we can look and see a wide panoply, a landscape of four orders of magnitude difference in the, in the burden of genetic changes that are observed with the whole genome or exome sequencing going from pediatric tumors that are very, uh, you know, that are fast and furious, so to speak, rhabdoid, Ewing sarcoma, uh, AML acute myelogenous leukemia, and then those that are environmentally driven, like lung cancers and melanoma, where smoking and, and, and UV light are driving them, you, you can see as many as four, four orders of magnitude more mutational load. Now, the problem is we don't have large enough numbers so that we can use frequency to pull out necessarily what we think the drivers are. We have a small smidget of information that suggests that there are a few of them. But again, I think how and in what way we look at these sort of NCIS uh, snapshots of what's the forensic picture of a cancer is very different from how we actually get there. So we've known for some time that cancer is a heritable condition. We go back to Paul de Broca, the, the wonderful uh, French neurobiologist in the 1860s who noted in his own family the extraordinary clustering of breast cancer with his sisters, mother, uh, grandmothers, aunts, and the like, and actually reported this. Did, we didn't know what genetics were about in those days, per se, but the, you know, the astute uh, intellect had clearly pointed that out. We had ages of twins, family, and sibling studies. We saw familial clustering, uh, such as uh, what Joe Fromani had pointed out, not necessarily for just one cancer, for sets of cancers, and then certainly the Knudsen hypothesis of knocking out both the germline and the somatic. You, you could get to cancer by having a germline inherited mutation and then have something show up uh, it's somatically. And then, of course, the positional cloning of a familial breast cancer gene in 91 that was by 93, 94 really uh, much better annotated than from Mary Claire King and on into the world of BRCA. So when we look at this, we've spent a lot of time trying to do positional cloning and identifying mutated genes in cancer susceptibility syndromes. And they're about 115 or 120, sort of depending on your definition right now. And this continues to evolve. Exome sequencing will continue to put more spots on the map. And one of the remarkable things is we really don't see, like we see in the infectious disease world, i.e., HLA, in terms of a concentration of a cancer region. And I think that really bespeaks how, how complex cancer is and the multiple different pathways that lead to it. These are ascertained in families with rare mutations and they have been instrumental in helping us to identify the concepts of both oncogenes, those where a single mutation would drive something in a tumor suppressor, where you remove those things that are sort of protecting you, letting the cell loose, so to speak. And then we also know that even in the world of BRCA1, the idea of the penetrance, in other words, you know, what's the risk that we would see is not identical for each individual, again, underscoring both the genetic and the environment. And we've seen this more in TCGA, where we clearly can see the impact of both germline and somatic mutations. When we look at the nearly 500 women with ovarian cancer, we could see a substantial fraction who had uh, germline, variation, germline mutations that were very important that had an impact on survival, but we could also see silencing of the gene and, most importantly, mutations in rearrangements in, uh, somatically. So, this sort of gets us to this question of these high penetrance mutations and somatic alterations. When we start mapping them, as Naz Raman did about a year ago, against the, the emerging databases like COSMIC and TCGA, 
nearly 50% of what we are assuming are the susceptibility genes are already in cosmic and with a frequency that would suggest that they really are drivers. So these are the unfortunate errors. And these are one, these are the, this is the world that's harder to understand, I think, using the, the world of um, ENCODE in terms of regulation. These are knocking out or doing something, creating a dominant negative in, in vivo, so to speak. And I think that that's a, a very different paradigm from where we go when we start for our search for common variants in complex diseases because we're going to build up to how we see the architecture of genetic uh, susceptibility. So we have very nice reproducible technologies that start out very easily when we put large collections together. And these chips give us a multiple testing problem that we've all roared at and had difficulty trying to figure out. We've come to this sort of quasi-conclusion of genome-wide significance. And that's been very helpful when we start to look at, for instance, cancer. So now there are some 490 separate loci that have been identified in more than two dozen cancers. There are another 120 that are sitting out there from the Ankaray that we've seen the data and have not yet made it to publication. So we can see that the world of cancer susceptibility, whether you're going from rare cancers, uh, some of the pediatric cancers like Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma, clearly have these common variants with small effects, to prostate and breast cancer where we're now able to explain a large fraction of the familial risk, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So interesting enough for all the excitement of CNVs back in the, uh, about 10, about seven years ago, it's sort of the Kahootek of genetic uh, susceptibility with respect to common variants. We've only seen one that's really been reproducible, that's of a common nature. Now when you go back to your germline susceptibility alleles that are important in these highly penetrant mutations, copy number becomes very important, but those are rare events. So if we're thinking of frequency against specifically the effect size, we, we see very little with respect to CNVs. Uh, interestingly enough, just shy of about 10% are shared between cancers. So again, we don't see these soft points where we could say other than the, the TERT region on chromosome 5 and 8Q24 and HLA for the viral driven cancers, we don't see regions where eight, nine, or 10 cancers are all lining up together. There seems to be, again, the, the suggestion of sort of uh, perturbation of, of literally the uh, sort of redundant pathways. Interestingly enough, and partly due to the, the way in which these studies are conducted and have collected samples, but also I think it's a, a question of the heterogeneity, almost none of these are only two or three that are associated with outcome. So raising the question, what's important for getting cancer may not be as important once you have it for your specific outcome. That's a whole other world of how that germline is, is functioning. And that's a very important question in thinking about pharmacogenomics, for which I think the ENCODE resource is really terrific. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned that there are more than 100, that's actually about 120 that will be reported very soon. Now if we look at this, we've done some work in our own I have Mitch McKeela sitting here in the audience who spent a fair amount of time trying to look at this same question that I showed you that over 50% of the known susceptibility highly penetrant mutants are actually in the cosmic database, suggesting that something about either germline or somatic alteration takes place. Well, Mitch looked at about just shy of 300 of the regions, mapped them, looked at the genes, and used a different, a, a series of different approaches to try and ask the question, are there indeed, is there a relationship between these common variants and somatic mutations? In other words, pointing towards specific genes being important that we would identify through our, our landscape sequencing of somatic alterations. And we really don't see that. In other words, as you can see here, these two circles look basically identical between the GWAS genes that we've mapped in the intervals in and around the GWAS hits of nearly 300 against a permutation of, uh, analysis of genes that are not in the GWAS regions that have anything to do with cancer. And it's very different if we were to go to those 115 genes that, we, that I referred to before, where over 50% of them we know are heavily mutated and are critical, you know, as identified in the cosmic database. So really, you know, the interpretation is that we're not necessarily looking at sufficient or required elements for developing cancer for any single one of those hits. So the correlation does not necessarily imply causation, and that's a, a dangerous view in the, in the GWAS, and one that some have continued to propagate, and some of us feel quite strongly it's not, 
partly because we know that we have primarily indirect associations. We have markers, and those markers are very important, but they give us that question of how do we then prioritize? And this is where there have been a whole score of papers that have been put out in the last few years using the ENCODE resources and DB Regulome and the like to be able to try and figure out specifically how and in what way can we prioritize these. And, and here are just a couple of things, you know, the statistical approach to prioritizing based on pleiotropy and annotation of the, of the ENCODE versus actually groups that have actually tried to do this for the known loci and see if we can see patterns. And the problem is with what we've seen in the genome-wide association studies, we don't really see patterns. We can't say beyond the very generic word that, they're that most of them look to be regulatory, but we can't say are they really all in enhancers, are they in silencers, are they important, you know, binding sites for transcription factors, for open or closed chromatin and the like. So I think we have to be really sort of careful about that. So really, can we use this? Yes and no in my mind. We can use it to start the discussion. But we know that each one of these GWAS singles has to go one by one investigation. The old Smith Barney television commercial for the older people, one snip at a time. You can't do it genome wide and getting the answer of what's the functional complement. I realize that's a little bit of a dangerous thing to say in front of the ENCODE audience, but I got to say it. <laughs> All right? It, and we know that these things are giving us important insights into the biology, but they're not necessarily causal, but they have a functional contribution. And I think where ENCODE really allows us, I think, to more effectively be, be smart is really looking at the integrating of the non-coding and regulatory information and the EQTLs and the like to be able to prioritize which variants are we going to take into the lab and actually try and make some sense of. So here's an example of Mila Propanina Olson in our program. Did a beautiful job in taking one of the bladder cancer hits uh, for the prostate stem cell antigen. It's just by chance that's its name. So she mapped this and imputed it, and then using the ENCODE was able to look at specifically all the correlated variants and see some of the activity that was in and around um, the promoter. And then the risk allele actually uh, turns out to be very important for actually the expression and showing a difference in both mRNA as well as protein as shown with immunohistochemistry. So this highlighted something we really hadn't thought about in bladder cancer, per se. And here is a very good example of a translational application because this SNP actually predicts for the degree of expression that's measurable, that's quite significant, and one can see actually that on the market, there were, I mean, not on the market, the pharmaceutical industry was trying to develop an anti-PSC, a monoclonal antibody, but for different types of cancer. So now there's been this discussion to try and bring this in, and the regulatory issues have held this up for a bit. But here is a possible clinical trial, taking something where you've gone from being able to map it, do the functional analysis, again, using ENCODE as part of that analytic strategy to be able to say, here we can show what we think are the functional underpinnings of this particular association, and just this is the real lucky one. This is the one in 475 that have ju has jumped off the page as clinically translatable. But hopefully the other 474 or whatever are, are out there and ripe for the taking at this time. So when we start thinking about this, we come back to how and in what way we use this to really look at what we know is sort of the sweep or the architecture of genetic susceptibility. And we clearly know here that in the GWAS world, we've been able to find common variants that really fit this sort of polygenic model of SNPs and SNPs and more SNPs, hundreds to thousands of SNPs to explain the, this part of the common disease uh, paradigm. But we also know that there are these rare damaging drivers that uh, I've made the case for, for BRCA1, TP53, RB, patch, and the like. So really the question is, what fraction of the polygenic component contributes to each cancer? So we've done an awful lot of scanning in our, in our world in the NCI, and we decided to look at 13 different cancers and then try and use some uh, of the newer approaches to take genotype SNPs and explain anywhere between 10 to 50 percent of the variability on the liability scale. So in other words, what fraction of the genetic contribution to that particular type of a common disease or not so common disease can we explain by the GWAS component? And this is looking at the, knowing that it's more than just the SNPs that have hit genome-wide significance, but rather there are a lot more underneath that curve. And when we look across those cancers, just seen here, 
we, we can clearly see that we can explain uh, some fraction that indeed does, does begin to approach what we've seen from the familial, the twins, and all the parent-child studies that have epidemiologically been done over the last 30 years. So the shared heritability, interestingly enough, does bring to bear some very interesting questions. We can see strong shared factors between things that have embryologic association, testes and kidneys, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and diffuse large B cell uh, uh, lymphoma. But we also could see things such as adult lymphoma and bone tumors in children. So again, using this as a way to try and put our hands around where are the things that are there that we haven't appreciated as, as models. And so going forward, as we know, all models are wrong, but some are useful, okay? And we have to start to think, how can we use this to think about how we would predict disease? Well, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. And this was said by a hero of mine, Yogi Berra. It's also said by not a hero of mine, Dan Quayle. But really, the person who really said this first was Niels Bohr, an absolutely brilliant person. And I think in doing this, we now have, with our GWAS world, uh, as well as the highly penetrant mutations, the ability to start to map and sort of look at what that genetic architecture looks like. So here, looking at breast cancer, we now know that we can actually explain 35 to 40 percent of the excess familial risk with these 160 SNPs in breast cancer. And we know that the highly penetrant mutations explain about 10 to 15 percent. So at this point, we can see that more than 50% of the risk of breast cancer in a family can be explained with the variants that we already know in hand. And the polygenic models, if we keep pushing them, have a potential to, uh, to add more to that. And exactly what that limit is, is a very important question. And if we start looking at the area under the curves, so ji Park and Nalanj and Chatterjee have spent a lot of time modeling this, we can actually see very interesting things that the total heritability corresponds to about a twofold sibling relative risk. And at the moment, we've been able to explain 1.4 of that, too. And as we continue to put that catalog together, we think that we top out at about an AUC of 80. This may not be good enough for an individual patient, but for public health measures, it could be very important in discriminating who would get earlier mammograms, who would get earlier interventions or preventive therapies. So again, how and in what way we use this information is, you know, in, in the public health venue, I think, is coming up on the horizon. For individually counseling people on the basis of SNPs, I think we still have a long way to go, despite what 23andMe and DecodeMe and others have wanted us to think. So we also can have to take advantage of the, the most important risk factor for most of our cancers, which is age. And so if you look at prostate cancer, if you take the 76 SNPs, you can see you can get a substantial uh, separation between the first and 99th percentile if you look at the distribution of those SNPs. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the cancer, but it's important for, in our minds, for public health, uh, really, implementation. Now, while we did these GWAS, we kept seeing these unexpected findings of, in the genome-wide association studies of large chromosomal abnormalities that turned out to be somatic mosaicism, part of this sort of dynamic genome where we know that there's a subpopulation that is clonally expanded and stable within either blood or buccal, and we can clearly see this. And as we've done now over 127,000 individuals, we're able to actually see the distribution of these events hitting all the different chromosomes, but particularly the X. The Y is even higher, and that's a more complicated story that, uh, for another day. But we used our GWAS uh, chips to be able to look at these greater than two megabase uh, events. Um, and Mitch McKeela, again, had done some very nice work in putting this together and looking at that landscape and being able to see that there were some recurrent events, which really raised this very important question in our mind, why are people walking around with these? And many of these, half of these are healthy controls who have not developed cancer per se. And, you know, what can we tolerate is an important question related to ultimately what may be a kind of question of sort of genomic stability in the large as opposed to thinking in the more classical Lynch colon cancer model. So we thought that it would be very interesting to ask this question as we see some of these events on chromosome 13 or 12 or 20 that are recurrent, 
could we use the ENCODE data to do breakpoint analysis, realizing that this is sort of first the, the roughest cut, so to speak, but nonetheless, is this going to be helpful for us to sort of hone in our regions that may be more amenable to these kinds of events taking place? Because we know these events take place in single base. There have been a number of nice papers in New England Journal of Medicine and Nature Medicine in the last uh, year showing that single base uh, point mutations are clearly there. And then we, of course, know all the, the classical uh, neurofibromatosis and, and Turner syndrome and the like. So we took uh, 688 interstitial events and 543 telomeric events and looked at the 200 KB windows of the SNPs around it and looked at those permutations both with respect to the region and then other regions of the genome. And what we interestingly saw was here is how we looked at each of the different elements sort of genome-wide of looking at the recombination rate versus the permutation distributions with 95 percent differences. First thing we saw was open chromatin looked at, uh, fairly interesting to us, and you see where these recombination mu's are moving over towards when we start looking at these, particularly in both telomeric copy neutral and interstitial losses. We also saw that repetitive elements did uh, bear some element on this. So again, the question is where and why these events are occurring in these kinds of places is a very difficult question. But in, you know, it, this is instead of 37,000 feet, we maybe move down to 25,000 feet in thinking about what's going on in the genome. And then interestingly enough, the gene-rich regions, we could particularly see with respect to the telomeric events and, and not as well with the interstitial losses that we saw. But again, in our minds, this raised a, a really a, sort of a fundamental question of really how and in what way we could look at, including the fragile site, the different elements that, that may tell us are there some regions of the genome that are going to be more sensitive and more likely to have these kinds of events taking place. Because we think of the detectable mosaicism as really the tip of the iceberg. We've clearly seen it in the large and small events, and we know it's a U-shaped curve. It's seen in the very young with catastrophic diseases, as well as now in the aging population. And we see it lining up for neurodegenerative disorders and the like. So in closing, you know, to me, the current challenge of taking and thinking about the relationship between germline and, and somatic and knowing that the germline itself is eroding and falling apart. The hardest thing that we have to explain is, for, for instance, for both, I think, the highly penetrant mutations and the, um, you know, the, the common variants, is this question of tissue specificity. The origin, could it be that the effects are really mediated through the adjacent cells or through immunologic modulation? Could these SNPs, for instance, be uh, modulating the immune system? And we clearly can see selective success of immune blockade, but not total the question of timings effects, and the hardest thing in my mind is going back to that first slide, is the interaction with the environmental stimuli. So let me end by saying, you know, again, kudos to the gang that had envisioned and kept the ENCODE alive despite all the different assaults and questions. I think that it's a spectacular resource for the functional basis of susceptibility. It's an opportunity to explore many novel elements, both individually and with their interactions. But I also have to have a call out to, I think, the, the value of team science, both in the short and long term, and the establishment of all of those extraordinary thresholds and standards that many of us can use to apply to different places. So there are obviously many people to acknowledge, uh, particularly the wisdom of Joe Framani and Bob Hoover, who over 40 years saw the value of biospecimens and having exquisitely well done studies has given us that opportunity to really go into the cancer susceptibility world. and certainly the acknowledgments of all the things that are part of the Oncoray Consortium that I've made allusion to. So why don't I stop there and see if there's time for questions. Thank you. I've always been curious, um, the, 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 occur the occurrence of variations at these sites and then the high correlation within the specific tissue to a particular transformed state, you know, seems logical and we've heard a lot about it. But in tissues where there is no evidence of a uh, disease state and the mutation is still there, do we know, uh, has that been studied in the sense that do, are there other 
um, compensating factors that sort of mitigate what, any uh, misregulation going on there, or? Well, it's a, it's a terrific question, and I think it raises two critical questions. One is, um, you know, how and in what way do we actually protect, uh, you know, why is it that, for instance, with BRCA1, is it breast and ovarian cancer, and it's not any number of other tissues per se? And, you know, this is where the question of environmental and secondary effects as well are very important, other genes that do interact or don't interact. But why, why we see that tissue specificity is still very much an enigma. And I, and I think, you know, we, we look at some cancers related to that and we say, you know, like with Harold Varmus had pointed out in the provocative questions, you have some tissues where you have extraordinary turnover, for instance, like the heart, and you have small intestines, and you see virtually no cancer whatsoever at all. And then, you know, and then you see other cancers of the skin where you see such a wide variety of the responses to, to UV light, and particularly the protection thereof in the repair mechanisms, that it ra really raises this question of, of really the timing and the extent to which those damages are exposed or not exposed. And so, you know, the 3D culture people are, 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 you know, showing very interesting data that if you take a mutation, you put it in a particular 3D culture, and then you start to let it grow to a certain point, there are intrinsic environmental properties that are not necessarily determined by, quote unquote, that genetic mutation that uh, are not linear, that allow for either the growth to begin to change in either its nature or in its, or in its trajectory. So what we really are missing is that three-dimensional character. I think, you know, when we look at so much of this genetic information and think of it as uh, a flat mutation, I, I, I wish I could answer your question better, but it's, it's really, it, to me, the $64,000 question in, in, in cancer susceptibility. You know, why is it that we're not getting cancer all the time in all of our tissues? One question, um, to what degree independently of breast cancer or prostate cancer, the obvious sex-specific ones, are you stratis stratifying the risk by sex because there are a lot of other cancers that have sex-specific susceptibility? You, you can. I mean, what's interesting, for instance, if you take the top you know, five or six cancers and you get beyond the sex-specific one, breast, prostate, ovarian, but you go to colon, you go to lung, you go to bladder, you go to pancreas, you really don't see a huge difference between sexes. And you don't see the, the variance or the incidence really is substantially different between them. Um, so, you know, it is an interesting question. And then you go to some others where, you know, as you get rarer and go down the line, you, you clearly see those kinds of changes. Uh, you know, I think how and in what way we can e explain that. I mean, with lung cancer, we used to do it with smoking behavior, but now that men and women smoke at comparable levels, we see pretty much uh, comparable lung adenocea, both incidence and survival in the West, at least. So you're encouraging us to think about the role of environment in cancer. Is, is something known at this point about how much of this would be shared environment private environment, say within family, as opposed to substantial variation across individuals. I'm curious because I'm wondering to what extent would this environmental effect be captured in family history, and to what extent would it be outside? Well, it, it's an excellent question. As you know, the history of linkage has always, you know, when we when we've tried to do a structured analysis before we started sequencing, and looking at the twin studies, we've always, you know, had these two categories of what's the heritable versus the environmental. The environmental in most of those studies has been relatively small in what could actually be characterized, and then there is the large we just don't know. Um, I, I think shared environment is clearly important, but again, it comes back to this question of, you know, the individual exposure, each person you know, what their, so to speak, carburetors are set at. And, and you look at BRCA1, for instance, you know, and there are, we already know of, you know, some fraction of the GWAS hits have very important modifying effects as we start to explain the differences in penetrance, you know, uh, by both mutations and within families. So I think, you know, the, again, the, the question of environment is very important in trying to sort of understand it as a model.
how you apply it specifically, uh, we still have a long way to go to be able to quantify that and put that into something that would be a suitable individual predictive model. You know, I mean, that's where I, I still worry that we have a little bit of a naive sense that we're going to be able to explain cancer risk to people individually as opposed to at a population level or perhaps at a familial level in terms of where you would fall in the distribution, but, you know, as opposed to actually being able to say you're going to get it or not get it deterministically. Sure. 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 Sure.